memories light up the sky of days when life for me meant holding on hoping that I would be strong always needing more to see that somehow I would surely find my way by faith I'd see a brighter day and I believe in the clouds and I believe in rain I believe in miracles and I believe that your love will always be the same I believe the sun will shine again Now I live in confidence I know that God above believes in me He touched my life and now I see that I'm a portrait of His love Created in His image, here I stand My life together in His hands And I believe in the clouds And I believe in rain I believe in miracles And I believe that your love Will always be the same I believe the sun will shine again I believe, I believe, I believe, and I believe in the clouds, and I believe in rain, I believe in miracles, and I believe that your love will always be the same. The sun will shine again. The sun will shine you Lord I'll always give you the honor the glory and the praise in Jesus name I pray amen, amen and amen if you have your Bibles with you turn with me to the book of John chapter 13 the, the book of John chapter 13 verse 36 The book of John, chapter 13, verse 36. The word of God says, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Here in this scripture, Peter confronts Jesus with a question born of concern, a 
question that had been worrying his heart and troubling his spirit. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you keep talking like you're about to leave us. Where are you going? You know, the Bible says in James 1.19 that we ought to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Some people like Peter are just the opposite. They're quick to speak and slow to listen. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, we notice in your teaching you keep alluding to and referring to your going away. Where are you going? If you tell us where you're going, when you are gone, we can follow you. Church, Jesus could have described a vision of the heavenly world that lay beyond Peter's view. He could have lifted the veil of human sight and thrilled Peter with a glimpse into the portals of heaven. Jesus could have expressed in great detail the matchless glories of the heavenly realm and the wondrous imagery of the eternal city. Instead, Jesus responded with didactive, corrective reasoning. That means Jesus didactive. He was going to teach and instruct. Jesus said, Peter, where I am going, you cannot follow now. But you will follow later. B but Lord, uh, why can't I follow you now? You know I'm willing to even lay down my life for you. Jesus answered Peter saying, Peter, this road I'm about to take, you cannot follow me on this road. Peter continued his protest. Lord, what's the problem here? Do you question the depth of my sincerity? The strength of my convictions? Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, let me tell you something about me that you may not know. Church, sometimes you want to jump in the scriptures and say, Peter, Peter, be quiet, Peter. It's Jesus you're talking to. You know, the one who can read hearts and, and see the inner workings of a man's mind. Oh, but Peter wouldn't quit. He said, Lord, let me make this unequivocally clear. You have no greater supporter than me. You have no greater protector than me. Unlike your other disciples, who when challenged by danger, they cower in timidity and fear. They are paralyzed by cowardice and dread, but not me. <laughs> I will lay down my life for you. I love the way Jesus responds. Jesus says, oh, you will? I, then Jesus said, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And then soon came that day when Jesus stood alone in the judgment hall of the high priest. Jesus was now a prisoner waiting to be tried and sentenced. Sitting in the hall, wearing his best disguise, was none other than Peter. You see, after Gethsemane, Peter had followed Jesus from afar off so he could remain out of sight. And yes, not only out of sight, but out of danger. And as the servants of the high priest sat down together, warming themselves before the fire, Peter sat with them, incognito, concealing his identity, masquerading as a member of the mob. One of the ladies glimpsed Peter from across the fire, and as the flickering flame danced across his face, Peter's features triggered a memory in her brain. I know this man. She watched Peter's conflicted face as the priests shouted and cursed at him. 
Because, you know, it was hard for Peter to sit there and watch his Lord abused. He was conflicted. She saw him wince and grimace as wicked men fill their mouths with spittle and hurl their spit right into the face of Jesus. Can you imagine somebody doing that to your child? It'll be hard for you to just sit there. You know what I'm talking about. Peter sat there grinding his teeth, holding back a scowl as they blindfolded Jesus and then slapped him in his face, shouting, so you're a prophet, tell us who hit you. And suddenly, that lady blurted it out, wait a minute, aren't you one of his disciples? Church, <laughs> that is one of those questions that can be very uncomfortable when asked in the wrong place and at the wrong time. You, you know, like, like a pastor in a strip club. Aren't you the pastor from over at the church? Peter answered, woman, I don't know what you're talking about. A few moments later, that woman got a better look at Peter, and this time she spoke with greater certainty. You are one of them. You know, you know can you imagine? Hey, everybody. In the strip club, look who's here. It is the pastor from down the street. This man is one of his disciples. I've, I've seen him with Jesus. Oh, yeah, someone else confirmed him. Yeah, he was with them. He's one of his disciples. Peter said, you all don't know what you're talking about. And then someone said, oh, oh, did you hear him? Did you hear his accent? He's not from around here. Look at Matthew 26, verse 73. The book of Matthew, verse chapter 26, verse 73. There it says in Matthew 26, 73, And after a while came unto him they that stood by him <laughs> and said to Peter, Surely thou also art one of them. For what? Your speech betrayeth thee. Your accent, the way you talk, gives you away. Church, most of you all will understand what I'm about to tell you. Have you ever noticed when you leave the islands or a foreign country, before you're a teenager and you come to America, if you come before your teenage years, you can drop most of your accent. Have you noticed that? But when you come, after your teenage years, that accent will be with you for the rest of your life. You can dress different, <laughs> you can walk different, but the minute you open your mouth, the world will know you're not from around here. I, I, I love to play with people from England with their British accents. Their, 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 their accents are so distinctive. And I'll say to them, I play with them, I say, excuse me, what part of the South are you from? <laughs> and it always brings a smile when they, some of them say, the South of England. <laughs> I believe that they actually train immigration officers to recognize accents. Mm -hmm. They will lean in. They will sometimes they lead in with their ears at the border when you and when they ask you, excuse me, where were you born? You, <laughs> if you answer, I was born in Chicago. They say, get out the car. Get out the car. <laughs> that's not gonna work. <laughs> well, that's what happened. A few people had gathered around Peter, saying. You're one of them. We can tell by your accent. You are Galilean. Church, everyone knew that people who worked for Jesus and worked with Jesus, after a while, their speech changed. Anybody here know that Jesus will clean up your mouth? Anybody here know he'll clean up your language? Anybody here can testify he'll clean up the words and the expressions that come out of your mouth? 
I can tell you when you study the word of God, after a while, your speech, you, you speak with precision. You speak with compassion and intelligence. Oh yes, the word of God will make you brilliant. Well, in an attempt to completely assure everyone that he was not with Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 74, Matthew 26, verse 74, that Peter began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not. Now, the Lord could have left that out of the scripture. He could have left that out. He could have just said, and he began to say, I know not the man. But, but the, <laughs> the Lord puts Peter on blast. He says, he began to curse this man who had been walking with Jesus for three years, who had seen his miracles, who had experienced the power of Christ's ministry firsthand. The Bible says there came out of his mouth a stream of filthy speech and profanity just to convince all who might hear him that he didn't know who Jesus was. And before Peter could finish speaking, a cock began to crow. And in that moment, Peter remembered what Jesus had told him. This night before the cock crows twice, thou shalt deny me three times. And when that cock crowed, Jesus turned to Peter and he looked at him. His face filled with disappointment and sorrow. He looked into the face of Peter. Ellen White says his look was one of peculiar sadness. Peculiar sadness. And it was a look that would stay with Peter for the rest of his life. The very thing he promised he would do. He said, I'm going to stand up for you. I'm going to speak for you. I'll give my life for you. When the moment arrived, the moment of truth arrived, the very thing he promised he would do, he couldn't do. He did not plan to be a coward. He did not plan to walk away in shame. He didn't intend to abandon his Lord, but it was the very thing he ended up doing. He did not plan to be known for the rest of human history as the man who ran and hid and denied his Lord when the going got tough. But that day, the hard-hitting Peter the Enforcer shriveled up like a spineless weakling when his Lord needed a witness to speak on his behalf. Church, this week as I read of this story and God put this Bible story in my heart, I began asking myself, why did Peter deny Christ? What caused Peter to deny his Lord? Well, you know what I told you last Sabbath that I do? I put on this lens, and as I studied the scriptures, I put on this lens of the centrality of God's character. And God helped me to see something that I want to share with you this morning, that Peter's failure was the result of a character defect. Peter's failure was because of a character defect defect. Peter's failure was because of a lack of a dimension of character he needed to develop. And this was precisely what Jesus warned Peter about. Look, look at it. Luke 2.31. Luke 2.31. The book of Luke. This is what Jesus warned Peter about. You, you've been with me for three years. Peter Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired. Huh? Speak up. To what? Sift you as wheat. I'm sorry, look at, it's Luke 22, verse 31. Luke 22, verse 31. And Luke 22, verse 32. I'm now on 32. But look at what the Lord says. But Peter, I have prayed for you. Here's, here's, his, here's his character defect. You don't have enough faith. 
I'm praying that your faith fail you. And then he says, and you're not converted. You've been with me three years, but you're not converted. You've been walking with me, hearing from me, listening to me, but you're not converted. Church, a failure of faith is a failure of character. And when there is a failure of character, there is a failure of faith. For three years, Peter had walked with Jesus. For three years, he had seen Jesus do miracles, even raise the dead. But in spite of his association with Jesus, Peter still lacked the faith he needed to be a man of godly character. Oh, that ought to shake you to your core. It means that some of us who can come to church year after year, week after week, and still not be converted. So the Lord says, listen to what she says. She says, God who knows the end from the beginning allowed Peter to reveal this weakness of character, she says, in order that he might see that there was nothing in himself that he should cause him to boast. And with groanings and bitter tears, we know that Peter asked for forgiveness for sin and God forgave him. I don't know about you, church, but there are times in my Christian journey when my faith gets weak. There are times in our Christian journey when our faith falters. You know, when you're going through a trial and you say to yourself, yes, I believe God is going to bless. You ever been there? I believe he's going to come through. But like Peter, you, you also pray, Lord, don't let my faith fail you. God, I know you know what you're doing with me. I'm just asking you, don't let my faith fail. That night in that judgment hall when Peter denied Jesus, Ellen White says, Peter that night was a very dim reflection of the character of his Lord. So the Lord says, even the best of us, if left to ourselves, will make mistakes and blunders. And even the most spiritual men and women struggle, struggle to be consistent examples of Christ-like character. She says, and we must forever be on our guard. You know, I, I, I want to address this carefully, but lately I've been hearing a litany of excuses used by Christian leaders to excuse the bad behavior of some of our leading politicians. I hear them saying we must excuse the bad behavior of these leading politicians because God uses imperfect servants and God is using them. And yes, it is true, none of us are perfect, and Peter was an imperfect servant. But here's the difference. Jesus prayed for Peter's deliverance from his imperfection. Jesus spoke to Peter publicly and privately of his need for repentance and conversion. And even though politicians are imperfect servants, the God we serve will not coddle or tolerate unrighteous conduct from anybody, whoever you are. God will not excuse arrogance. God, are you listening to me today? God will not excuse ignorance or meanness. And this claim of being an imperfect servant being used by God is not a shield from the judgment of God. Instead, instead, what I see in this Bible is that God always sends a righteous witness to call imperfect servants to repentance. 
He never sends righteous leaders to coddle any leader or spoil them or protect them in their unchristlike behavior. God always sends his servants to warn leaders of judgment and in love, in love, call them to repentance. He did that with Samuel when David sinned. Somebody say amen. amen. He did that when Elijah, he with Elijah when Ahab and Jezebel sinned. He did that with John the Baptist when Herod sinned. And Herod took John the Baptist's head for it. He sent Paul to Agrippa and sent Paul as a witness before Caesar. God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says righteousness exalteth a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. And when the church hear me today, hear me today, this is so tough. This is so difficult. But when the church abandons its prophetic voice and its calling to speak righteousness and truth to power, the church, my Bible says, becomes a whore. The church that is not a righteous witness to power is a Babylonian hall. <laughs> you don't know what I'm talking about. Look at Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. Revelation 14, verse 8. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Because she did what? She made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The church that is not a righteous witness is a harlot. And, and you know what? You know what a harlot is? <laughs> Thank God I've never been with one, but I know what they're like. She's with you, but she doesn't love you. The church that does not speak truth may hang with you, but they don't love you. For if she truly loves you, she would not pamper you in your sinfulness. She would not indulge any leader, any nation in wickedness. So the Lord says that Jesus did not, check this out, she said Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. Oh, that night in front of that fireplace, even though he had walked with Jesus for three years, Peter missed an opportunity to show that the character of Jesus was living in his heart. And Peter showed that he was unaware of his own character defects. The servant Lord says it this way. She said, God who knows the end from the beginning, remember, allowed Peter to see himself. But Peter learned something even more valuable, and that's what I want to preach about for the rest of this sermon today. He learned something that would shape his ministry and his teaching. And more than anyone else, brothers and sisters in scripture, Peter's spiritual teaching emphasis became for the rest, are you with me today, for the rest of his ministry, building Christ-like character. That became his ministry teaching emphasis, becoming more like the nature, likeness, and character of God. And Peter understood better now what Jesus meant when he said to him in Luke 22, let's look at it one more time, Luke 22, verse 32, when he said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. For the first time, Peter understood what strengthening the brethren meant. It meant help God's, oh Lord, I hear your voice. Help God's people grow. Help God's people grow in Christ-like character. And since his conversion, teachers, 
Peter's teaching legacy became focused and profound. First of all, Peter uses his own betrayal and his own conversion to teach us what he learned about the need for character. Peter is saying to us in his letters, here's what Peter is saying, I made an error from which you, the church, must learn. I learned the hard way that conversion is both a decision, a decision I made to follow Christ, but it is also a process. I learned that conversion is both a radical change of feelings and motives, but I also learned that conversion is a change of heart. And if you ask Peter, he would be the first to tell you when he decided to follow Jesus, he thought he was converted. So imagine the shock to hear Jesus in the upper room. Peter, you're not yet converted. Peter said, it was after I betrayed the Lord that I learned <laughs> that if you're not growing in grace, you are not converted. If you are not growing, and you can change the title to growing in grace. If you are not growing in grace, you are not converted. What? Peter did not understand at the time is what we don't understand or appreciate enough today. Conversion is daily growth. And growing daily in grace is the sign of genuine conversion. I'm going to preach it this morning. On this Christian journey, there are dead Christians and living Christians. And here's the difference. Living Christians are the ones who are growing every day. Living Christians are the ones who are intentionally practicing self-denial every day. Living Christians are the ones who are advancing. You're not what you used to be. It's wonderful to hear people in this church say, Pastor, since I've been coming to this church, I'm not the same person. The teachings, the sermons have changed me. As a Christian grows and advances towards perfection, they experience conversion every day. And let me tell you something I want you, can I teach here this morning? Your conversion is not complete until Jesus hands you your crown of life. Your conversion is not complete until Jesus puts on you the robe of immortality. Here's what the servant of the Lord says. Here's what she says. Let no one suppose that conversion is the beginning and end of your Christian life. She said, there is a science of Christianity that must be mastered. And there is to be growth in grace. Grow in grace. That's my message this morning. We ought to, she said, we ought to have constant progress and constant improvement. And that's why in 2 Peter, Peter's last letter to the churches. Let's look at it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Look at what Peter is saying. This is Peter's teaching. This is the essence of his message. First chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us Everything we need. Hallelujah. Give all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue and goodness. And look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness. Besides this, give all diligence. Add to your faith. What? Virtue to virtue. What? Knowledge and to knowledge, what? 
temperance and the temperance, patience and the patience, godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness and the brotherly kindness, charity. And look at look at verse eight. For if these qualities, these 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 dimensions of character be in you and what and what abound in you. You know what that means. You know what that means. Abound means that word means it, they're increasing. Amen. Hallelujah. God. They're increasing. They will keep you from being unfruitful and barren and useless in the knowledge of your Lord. In other words, if you are not growing, you are barren. You are unfruitful. If you ask Peter, he would tell you himself, that was his mistake. And it was the mistake of churches. It is the mistake of churches from the time of Christ. Too many of God's children are not growing in grace, becoming like Jesus. Sadly, this has not been the teaching focus of most churches. And in many, time, in many ways, in many instances, it's not been the teaching focus of our own church. And that's why you will see on, on, on the reviews of some people when they come into our church and churches, they say they are treated like dumb. They are not treated nicely because we don't teach that you've got to grow out of your meanness. I'm saddened to say it, but growing in grace to become like Jesus has never really been high on the agenda of most Christian churches. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 17. Second Peter 3, verse 17. Ye therefore, beloved, mm -hmm, hallelujah God, this is Peter's last writing to his church, to the churches, and to us. He says, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware, 2 Peter 3, verse 17, beware, lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. And then he says in verse 18, but grow in grace. How do I know that this is Peter's message? There is no other place in the Bible where that phrase is used but by Peter. Grow in grace. Peter's warning to the church is don't make the mistake I made. Understand that when you choose to follow Christ, that's just the first phase of your conversion. There is a second phase. It's called grow in grace. And if you don't grow in grace, you'll betray the master like I did. Peter's warning us, if you don't grow in grace, you will betray the master in thoughts, in words, in deeds, in attitudes. But when you are growing grace, you won't gratify the lust of the flesh. Church, Peter's final counsel to us is grow. Grow in grace. You know, I'm going to read you something that some of you may not like to hear. But it's from the spirit of prophecy anyhow. Servant of God says, those who accept the Savior, however sincere their conversion, should never be taught to say or to feel that they are saved. You know, people always ask you that question. You say? Ellen White says, those who accept the Savior, however sincere your conversion, should never be taught to say or feel you have the right to say you're saved. She says, this is misleading. She says, everyone should be taught to cherish the hope that you are saved and the faith that you are saved. 
And even, but even when we give ourselves to Christ and know that he accepts us, she says, we are not beyond the reach of Satan. We are not beyond the reach of temptation. She said there are too many who rejoice that they are saved, but they don't comply with the conditions of salvation. Yeah, I'm saved. Hold on a minute. Let me get a cigarette. You know people like that? I'll never forget, and some of you may have heard me tell this story before because it's true. A, great, a mayor of one of our nation's great cities was caught in the FBI sting one time. The FBI were filming him in the hotel room with the young lady, the prostitute, and he was on sitting on the edge of the bed with her rubbing her thighs, and then you heard him say into the microphone, ooh, the Lord sure been good to me. True, true story. There are people who will say they're saved, but they're not complying with the conditions. So let me say, how, Pastor, how do I grow? I'm going to grow in grace. Anybody want to grow in grace today? Come on, anybody want to grow in grace? Pastor, how do I grow in grace? Well, first of all, let me tell you, growth is silent. Can't see it. Hallelujah, God. Growth is imperceptible. Growth is continuous. Growth requires good habits. Growth requires nurturing and feeding. Growth requires monitoring. Growth requires adjustment. Are you listening to me today? Growth requires correction. Growth requires pruning. Growth requires conforming your life to the principles of the character of God. Growth requires the investment of your time. God gave this to me. Time is the fertilizer that facilitates your growth. If you are not spending time studying Christ and imitating Christ, you cannot expect to see growth and daily improvements in your character. Growing in grace means giving up your own ideas and plans to follow God's ideas. He said, he was the one who said, the seventh day is the Sabbath day. Remember it, keep it holy. So gr growing in grace means I'm surrendering my own ideas and my own plans to the word and will of God. Church, 99% of the entertainment we watch is not conducive of spiritual growth. It is. Our problem is that most of the time we invest in watching television and social media and the internet. It's not designed to help you grow spiritually. Can I, can I spell that out? I-T-I-S-D-E-S-I G-N-E-D-T-O-H-E-L-P-Y-O-U-G-R-O-W-S-P-I-R-I-T-U-A-L-L-Y. It is not designed to help you grow spiritually. If, if, you, get an, if you get an opportunity, I want you to watch a documentary on Netflix. It's called The Great Hack. It'll blow your mind. It shows how the enemies have figured out how to use Facebook against you. Anybody on Facebook? Yes, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. It blew my mind. It shows how they use Facebook and other social media to get you to think the way they want you to think how to do what they want you to do and how to vote the way they want you to vote. And the most vulnerable people among us, you know what they call us? The persuadables. 
And if you are not growing in grace, you are part of that group, the persuadables. Because only those who are growing in grace can say, in all these things we are more than conquerors, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor light, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, I am persuaded, no depth or any other creature shall be able to separate. I am not one of your persuadables, for I am persuaded that Christ is my Lord. I am persuaded that the supreme purpose of human existence is the development of my character. Can I say this one of the most important sentences I'll ever speak? I am persuaded that the supreme purpose of my existence is the development of my character to become like Jesus. That's why I'm here. The reason we are on this earth is to grow in grace. But pastor, how do I grow? Well, I can tell you, I'm gonna give you before I leave you. Every day, study and copy the life of Jesus. Every day, study critically the features of your character and know your own defects. Know your own defects. Peter got in trouble because he didn't know himself. Jesus tried to point it out. And then you ask God, God, give me the grace to change. And you'll find through the study of God's character, through the contemplating of the life of character of Jesus, Every day, every day, it's a sweet thing. Every day you will grow. Every day you'll feel yourself being stretched in a beautiful way. Every, hallelujah God. Every day you'll feel yourself stretched. As a matter of fact, if you are never uncomfortable, that means you're not being stretched. If you're not being stretched, you are not growing. If you're not being stretched, it's a sign. You're not growing. Say to yourself, what would Christ do were he in my place? He's trying to stretch you. And let this thought stretch you and help you determine your duty and measure your faithfulness. Pastor, how can I really grow in grace? Well, I can tell you some more things. Every day, every day, do something to improve your life spiritually. So what did you do today? to improve your life spiritually. I got up, I had my worship, I came to church looking for a blessing from the Lord. What are you gonna do tomorrow? Every day do something to improve your life spiritually. Do something to beautify. Ellen White says, do something to beautify your life spiritually. Every day study, not just the out, some of us study the outlines of the life of Jesus. You need to study the details. You know, folks say, well, I heard that story. You didn't really hear that story. I'm, this is one of the things I love about being a preacher. I'm teaching you things. You heard the stories, but you never saw it that way before. Remember, your goal in life is to become like Jesus. And the more closely you study his character, the more closely you will resemble his character. So I have a growth strategy, and let me tell you what it is. And you may want to write it down, but you don't even, may not even to, need to write it down because it's so easy to remember. I call it LEAP. LEAP! L-E-A-P. What is it? LEAP. What is it? LEAP. LEAP. And let me tell you what LEAP stands for. Learn and study the principles of God's character. Learn them. Learn them. E. Explain and share them. Explain and share those principles with others. Here's what Ellen White says. She says, one of the divine plans for growth is impartation. Oh, so, boy, y'all don't get as excited as I do reading this stuff. I'm so excited because I'm learning. Amen. 
She said, one of, the, one of the divine plans for growth is sharing what you have learned. That's what she means by saying impartation. Imparting to others helps you to grow. She said, the Christian is to gain strength by strengthening others. Well, that's what the Bible says. Look at Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25. Look at the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verse 25. I'm having a, a good time preaching the word of God this morning. Chapter 11, verse 25. What does it say? It says, he that the liberal soul shall be what? Made fat. And he that watereth shall be watered also himself. And why says this is not merely a promise, it is a divine law. It is a divine law. When you help other people and bless other people, when you share and explain what you've learned, those powerful principles will help you to grow. And then that's L E A. How you spell leap? What comes after? What's the next letter? P. You know? Oh, oh, you're with me today. Hey, amen. A, and A means apply. Apply the principles you learn to your own life and then practice. The last one is P. Practice what you've learned. And how do you practice? You obey all the time. That's how you practice. You obey God's promptings. Hallelujah. You obey his commandments. You practice what you've learned. And then Ellen White says, as in nature, so in grace. As in nature, so in what? Grace. She said, there can be no life without growth. The plant must either grow or die. As its growth is silent and imperceptible but continuous, so is the development of the Christian life. And at every stage of development, your life may be perfect in the eyes of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And if God's purpose for us is fulfilled, there will be continual advancement. I wish I could preach everything I prepared today, but I can't. Before I leave you, I got to tell you what I learned about growing lately. This year has been one of the most wonderful years of my life. I have never planted anything in my life. But I did a couple years ago. And this year, I had a wonderful crop. From my first mango tree. Mm, 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 mm. Y'all didn't tell me it was this good. Now, I did not grow a mango tree to look at its leaves. I did not grow a mango tree to marvel at its green shrubbery. I grew a mango tree so that it could have some mangoes and I could have something sweet to remind me of the goodness and glory of God. Well, God wants you to grow in grace. So he can see the sweet fruit of holiness growing in your character. The sweet fruit of holiness growing in your character. Today, you may be one of those people. We've been coming to church week after week. But you really haven't seen the kind of growth, spiritual growth, in your life that you 
hoped to see. I want to tell you that God's got a promise for you. If you will submit to him, he will help you every day to grow in grace. You know, I thought of that, what growing in grace meant, what it means to grow in grace. <laughs> what that means to me is as you grow, you're going to need grace. Because as you grow, you may not always get it right. You're going to need grace. As you grow, you may stumble, but you're growing in grace. As you grow, you may make mistakes. You may falter, but you're growing in grace and that's why you are here God is testing you mm. and those trials are growing you I shared with someone this week God is a God of balance. That's the other thing that's needed to grow, balance. Thank God one arm isn't here and the other one down to my ankles. Because <laughs> God is a God of balance. He gave me two eyes. Thank God he gave me two nostrils. He gave me two ears. I can hear in stereo because God loves balance. gave me two legs and he, he's a God that wants you to have balance spiritually so you can grow sometimes when I take my the water to, to be tested the man will say hey you need to raise your pH level Y'all know what I'm talking about? Or even in our bodies, they may say, you need to raise the pH. pH stands for potential for hydrogen. You need to raise that level. And then God said, you know what pH stands for? For a positive, happy attitude. <laughs> so turn to the person next to you and say, raise your pH level. Be positive. Be happy. And grow in grace. Grow in grace. Will you bow your heads with me? Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for this call, this invitation from the writings of Peter, from the experience of Peter, reminding us that we have to grow in grace daily. Father, Every one of us here today can see in our lives areas where we must grow. Some of us have to address the kind of fertilizer, the time where we invest our time. Is it helping us to grow spiritually? Some of us, to 
Dear God, I'm calling you in faith, begging in the name of Jesus that you show us how to grow in grace. My brother, my sister, if you want to commit your life today to this call and purpose, if you want to commit your life today from this day forward, God, help me to grow every day, to grow in grace every day. I invite you to stand with me today. If you want to say that to the Lord, Father in heaven, help me every day to grow in grace. It's a simple prayer, but it's the prayer of your heart today. Father, help me to grow in grace. Help me to become all that Jesus longs for me to be. Help me to become like Jesus. Help me every day to grow in grace. Father, you've seen those who have stood today committing their lives, committing themselves to a new investment of time, a new investment of all the blessings that you've given them so that they can have this as their clear focus in life to grow in grace. May this be our blessing until Jesus comes. May everybody standing here today, everybody seated, may everyone under the sound of my voice so over the internet, wherever you may be, may this be your blessing that every day you will grow in grace until the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is my prayer for you. Amen. And amen. Please be seated. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only me on Jesus' name, on Christ the Son.